Um, let's see. I mean, it's a pleasure to be back here. I mean, uh, when I came in, I thought, am I going to the L2 cohomology room? Because I realized that that was, uh, the, you know, that was still what my associations uh, with this room were, are. Uh, let's see. M probably the most important thing that I need to do in this talk is advertise. Okay, so I'd like to advertise that there's a new journal of applied and computational topology. Okay, so it's a Springer journal and um, so I think if you uh, remember it's a Springer journal and you remember the, the letters APCT and you do the appropriate search, you will find it. Okay, and I'd like to encourage people to submit brilliant work that, sh you know, that has fantastic theorems that completely changes our point of view of some part of science and that can then be patented and bring in fantastic royalties, which Springer will only take 70% of. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, but, you know, we'll also take other stuff, okay, you know. Uh, so anyway, I, I, so this is sort of... Uh, um, my main, you know, my main commercial uh, goal uh, was the advertising of, of this journal. Um, so the talk that I'm giving today um, is mainly computational topology. And so I'll talk about function spaces and I want to talk about some ways in which we're understanding function spaces better. Um, but, okay, so let me just write that down, okay? So I'm interested in, understand, in understanding the maps from x to y. Okay, that sounds, okay, where x and y are reasonable, right, because surely there's no reason to be unreasonable um, before you're reasonable, right? I mean, when you're done being reasonable, then you can move on. And, ma and, and the maps, okay, well, we'll start off with them being continuous, but maybe that's a little unreasonable, okay? Well, we have to move on. Well, you know, I mean, you know, we'll negotiate, you know, a as we move on, right? Because after all, I want to understand, I'm interested in understanding. And understanding is the key word uh, in, uh, in what originally motivated me to, to consider these questions. And I've been thinking about them for, for a very long time, for at least 10 or 15 years. So I will not be able to dump all, you know, everything on you in under an hour. Okay? If you would have given me an hour talk, you know, then I might have stood a chance. But, uh, yeah. but, but actually, so, so, okay, so let's try to think about this. Right? Suppose that I tell you you want to understand a function space. Right? So what, you know, I mean... You know, so then the question is, what kind of person you are? What does it mean to understand it? Right? Some kind of person will say, oh, well, I'm going to first think about the case where y is the real line. Okay? And then I'll be looking at some space of maps. Okay? And then I'll have to decide what, what norm do I put on. Okay? And the truth is that this is really beautiful, infi usually infinite dimensional geometry. If you decide L2, then you're in a Hilbert space. You decide I'm going to look at C infinity or in a fresh A space. You get to choose which Banach space you want to live in or worse. Okay? And good for you. Okay? That's not what I want to study. Okay? There's lots of beautiful geometry in infinite dimensional spaces. That's not what I'm interested in. Okay? So, what I, so, um, let, let's, Try again, okay? So, no, <laughs> okay. That's not what I what I want to do, okay? So, let me get. I'm going to give three motivations. Uh, I don't know that, and uh, so one motivation might be you want to understand this space well enough to try to do learning in it, okay? So. Uh, 
Okay? Now, if you want to do learning, sort of a very standard setup might be you're in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Ah, Hilbert space, right? You know, right? right? That forced on you which Banach structure you want to do because you want your algorithms to be nice. You go ahead and ask, which kernel should I use? And they say, oh, that's proprietary. But anyway, you still prove the theorems and you get convergence in L2 or whatever. So you're very, very fine when y is r, right? But if you have something that's genuinely nonlinear, okay, and for example, if y were the circle or the two sphere or just a space y, and you want to do this, then you lose the linear structure and you still might want to go ahead and try to learn. Okay? And, well, okay, so that's sort of one kind of motivation. And, by the way, I mean, there are people who work on this and without doing what I'm going to tell you to do, and, and I'm not saying they're wrong. <laughs> I'm just saying they're different than me. Motivation number two, um, let me say, is Maurice's talk from yesterday, which, uh, for the people watching, Sorry, you should have come. Okay, uh, Maurice explained how certain problems in distributed computing, you have a whole bunch of different processors and you're trying to divide up a problem among them, gets reduced to problems involving functions, continuous functions from an input space to an output space, something like that. Um, and it's really remarkable that the continuous functions occur. Okay, so in that case, you were forced into C0. You don't get to choose a Hilbert space. You don't got nothing. Okay? But if you look at what Maurice did, I'd, he assumed that all of these computers were absolute, they might be evil, right? <laughs> they were the evil computers, but they all had infinite power, right? I mean, they weren't ba we weren't bounding um, in any way the resources available to the computers, right? What we were just doing was studying the implications about how hard it is to communicate and, you know, and having such failures and not being able to rely on one another. Okay, so um, it turns out that if you want to, bounding the resources, available to processors, is tantamount to restricting F to be Lipschitz with some Lipschitz constant. Okay, so I'll remind people what Lipschitz constants are. In fact, why don't I do it right now before I get to motivation number three? Huh? Okay, so we're in the following situation. We have X has a metric. And Y has a metric, and I'm a notation abuser, so I will use the same letter D for both metrics. Okay? And we say that F is L Lipschitz if the distance between Fx, Fx prime is at most L times the distance between Xx prime. Okay? Under normal circumstances, okay, X and Y say being finite complexes, there, the set of Lipschitz functions is dense in the set of continuous functions. Okay, so in fact, the space of Lipschitz functions is dense and a deformation retract in the space of continuous functions. Okay, so that's one of the great things about algebraic topology. You know, although things are phrased in terms of continuous functions, you do some simplicial approximations. There's really actually a lot of flabbiness about exactly which function spaces you're in when you're doing the algebraic topology. Now, if you are, so, turns out that this L Lipschitz condition, it, it tells you, if you wanted to build a simplicial approximation, it tells you how fine a mesh you have to choose in your subdivision of your domain in order to get a reasonable approximation to your function. Okay, so this, is re this looks like analysis, but it's really combinatorics. Okay, uh, it's really nothing to be frightened of. And then, of course, when you think about this condition, you know, if you're going to be doing problem number one, you want to learn a function, right? You would presumably want to choose a fairly dense set of points. Okay, and now if your points are sufficiently dense and you know that your L Lipschitz, so every point in your space is within epsilon of one of 
your sample points, so then you know you're going to approximate your function to within epsilon times L. So if you've controlled L, you know, so this is a reasonable class of functions to try to learn. Okay? And this is, by the way, a thing that people routinely do. You know, you would go ahead, you'd want to learn a function, say, on the real line. You choose a bunch of samples. Then what do you do? You connect the dots and draw a graph. And if your thing, function had been Lipschitz, this connect the dots th thing will be very predictably close to your function. Okay? I mean, you, you tell me whether you, they would produce deterministically, non-deterministically, and I'll output the theorem. And then that's sort of a wonderful thing, because when you apply the algorithm that you do, when, assuming it's Lipschitz, then it applies even if your function is merely continuous, it's just that the rate fails. Okay? And that's sort of a lot of what I hope for in life. You know, to try to prove theorems about algorithm, you know, that you make extra assumptions as sort of uh, scaffolding, and you have conditions, and you have rates, and all that. And then, of course, you'll apply them to situations where your hypothesis fails, and that won't bother you. You won't feel that you're cheating. You're just saying, I hope I'm lucky. Okay? That maybe the algorithms will still work. So, so Lipschitz very often has that role. Lots of things in life are not Lipschitz, like Brownian motion is only holder. Okay? But, you know, still, you know, you try. So anyway, so um, both one and two... Uh, will lead you to think about spaces of Lipschitz functions. Okay, so I'm going to make a few trivial remarks about spaces of Lipschitz functions, but now let me talk about motivation three, which is the motivation that I have to admit is nearest and dearest to my heart, which is this, which is understanding 20th century topology. Okay. Okay, so 20th century topology had a very, very particular paradigm that only, um, and sort of the idea would be you start with a geometric problem, you associate to it a function, okay, and then you Then you sell it to an algebraic topologist. Okay, and th then the algebraic topologist, okay, I'll, I'll say something about it, and then you allegedly get a solution. Okay, so let me talk about one example of this. There are, you know, but sort of the whole, I mean, but this was sort of the paradigm that people constantly used, like smell, uh, inverted the two-sphere, right? I mean, you know, you could turn the sphere inside out. That's the calculation. The calculation after you sell it to the algebraic topologist was that pi 2 of SO3 is zero. Wow. Okay, but if you really want to understand it, you have to see the movie, right? I mean, you know, I mean, it was actually a very, very non-trivial task to turn the statement that pi 2 of SO3 equals zero and that therefore you can turn the sphere inside out to actually understand what happened right, uh, you know, is, you know, that's, that's a challenge, okay? I want to talk about a different example uh, to concentrate our minds rather than the immersion example. And let me talk, mention the work of Rene Tom. Okay, Rene Tom was interested in the question, if M is a compact manifold, Let's say smooth, we can negotiate about oriented. Okay. When does there exist a W such that M is the boundary of W? Okay. That was the question he asked. Okay. So, like, there's some easy cases. Like, if M is one point, no. Okay. M equals two points. Well, then it depends on whether you're oriented or not. Oriented, no. Okay, but unoriented, it bounds, of course, the interval. Okay, and when the way it's the boundary of an interval, they get opposite signs, so that's why. Okay, and et cetera. So he gave, and so he gave necessary and sufficient conditions. Okay, 
Okay, so what, what he actually did was, it's a breathtaking paper, he introduced transversality, he studied the universal bundle on the Grassmannian, and introduced Tom spaces, lots of beautiful stuff, some of which I might get back to, circle, but, I, but, not, but for now, let me just say that, so, oh, so here, let me, let me tell you the answer, because the answer is so gorgeous, and you don't have to, you know, and, and so here's what you do, you take the manifold, and it has a tangent bundle, Okay, so that gives, then gives you a map into a certain Grassmannian. Okay, okay, you can think about it concretely. You take your manifold, you embed it in Euclidean space. At each point, you have a tangent vector. Okay, so now you have a tangent plane. So now you have a map from the manifold to the space of planes in some very high-dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, so this is a, a map, and Rene Tom's condition, he proved this in the unoriented case and in the oriented case. It turns out to be the exact same answer, which is you push the fundamental, you think about M as a cycle in the homology of the Grassmannian, okay? And it has to be zero. That's a necessary and sufficient condition, okay? I mean, absolutely, you know, and one direction is really easy because, of course, if something bounds, then gonna, you'll see the chain that it bounds, okay? But this reversing is just like a crazy thing, right? I mean, it's not hard to see that if M is small, fairly small in some geometric sense, then this cycle will bound something fairly small, if it bounds anything at all, okay? That's what isoparametric inequalities are for, okay? So, you know, this, it shouldn't be impossible to understand, and that's what I will uh, get back to in a second. So this, so uh, Tom did this in the unoriented case, and Milner and Wall did this in the oriented case, but it's the same answer. If you're, okay. okay. Um, and, I mean, and the hard part, as far as the algebraic topologists are concerned, is that this is equivalent to saying that a certain map from a very high dimensional sphere to a certain finite complex called the Tom space is null homotopic. Okay, so you know, so understanding this algebraic topology is pretty hard. And as I said, Renee Tom got the Fields Medal for this paper, and uh, and this part of it he needed Sarah's help to do. Okay, and then the oriented case that took you know more than another decade before it was completed. So this is a hard piece of algebraic topology, and that's not what I'm interested in understanding. Okay, a because I, read, I was supposed to have learned that in graduate school. But anyway, but I'm not gonna learn it now, okay? But what I wanna learn is what in the world happened here, okay? Okay, there's this really violent moment when you do these things, when you, when you algebraicize a problem. And um, I think it's worth explaining the violence of algebraicization. Okay, so, uh, so I will get to that in a minute. Let me just talk about what the connection between these things are. Um, and, and raise a concrete question. That was, so here's a question raised by Gromov. Suppose M is bounded, okay? By which we mean the following. We'll say that V of M is the smallest volume of any metric on M such that the curvature of the metric is bounded by one, and the injectivity radius of M is at least one. So this, it doesn't really matter how you normalize. What you want to say is that the local geometry is everywhere boring, right? You've, you've said that it can't be that different from flat space in the small, okay? But in the large, you're then going to ask how, how big is it, right? How many pieces does it have, okay? So this is a measure of the complexity of M. And then Gromov asked, how big is the smallest W that M bounds if ba M bounds anything at all? Okay? Right, not everything does. Okay? In dimension two, every oriented thing does. Dimension three, every oriented... Every, everything actually does. Okay, so you know you could just go ahead. I mean, this this problem is analyzed. So if M bounds, what is the complexity? So Gromov gave a bound. He said that 
The best W is at most 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the volume of m, where this number is dimension minus 1. Okay, that's Gromov's upper bound. Which, by the way, means that verifying Rene Tom theorem is going to be pretty hard. I mean, you could verify it step by step by doing mathematics, but actually finding the bounding manifold could take you some time, okay? especially as the dimension goes up. Okay? And Gromov made the conjecture that this is less than some constant depending on dimension times the volume of m. Okay? He believed linear. I mean, he didn't make this conjecture in print, so I can't blame him for it. Okay, uh, but I'm pretty sure I heard him say, <laughs> okay, and I, so I, okay, so I will want to um, discuss, discuss this, okay, wherein lies the truth, okay? Now, what does this have to do with Lipschitz functions? Okay, well, what's happening? You're taking a manifold and you're looking at some Grassmannian, okay? Right, so the Grassmannian, the way at which, the rate at which a Grassmannian is changing has something to, you know, that has something to do with the, the curvature. Okay, so your curvature conditions end up giving you a bound on the Lipschitz constant. Okay, I haven't shown you how the Lipschitz constant grows, okay, uh, with the volume, but that would involve understanding actually what this Tom map is. So maybe I'll leave that alone, but I'll just say that the hypotheses translate into a condition on the Lipschitz constant of Tom's map. Okay? So, in, so what will be the strategy? Okay? The strategy should be something like I have a, lip, a, I have a map from a sphere to a Tom space, okay, and I, have a con and I know it's null homotopic, and I know it's Lipschitz constant, I'd like to say I don't have to increase the Lipschitz constant too much to make it null homotopic, okay? So all my friends here, so what does everyone tell me I should be doing? I should be studying the persistence homotopy of the Tom space with respect to the Lipschitz filtration. Okay, right? You, you think about the continuous functions, right? You could approximate them by Lipschitz functions. The Lipschitz functions are filtered by what the Lipschitz constant is. As the Lipschitz get, constant gets bigger, we've seen that the functions are harder to understand. They become more geometrically complex, so that's a good filtration, okay? Then, you know, I'm unfortunately going to need to apply it in homotopy theory rather than homology. Okay, we can negotiate something. We'll, we'll talk later, okay? Right, but this might be what people would you know, given the spirit of the conference. The same mathematics that we've been using for data analysis and other purposes throughout the conference should be applying to these kind of geometric questions, okay? If we could understand anything at all about this, okay? Okay, so let me begin trying to list my goals. So goal number one is the evil of algebraicization. The second part is why persistence homotopy is not enough. And then I want to get back to what we've learned about function spaces. Okay, and if there's time, then we'll figure out, then step four will be to figure out what step five is, and that will be the rest of the talk. Okay, so let's see if we could get through these. Okay, are there any questions about this so far? Okay, what I'm hoping to do is, right, you know, I think, right, the issue is clear, right, we want to understand continuous functions from something, from a, one space to another. The fact that you could do this is absolutely amazing, right, I mean, the map from SN to SN, that was a great theorem of Brouwer, okay, and then the fact that you could do SN plus one to SN, you know, and, and further and further, it's just absolutely crazy that the algebraic topologists are able to do these things, that they could go from SN plus 50 to SN when N is bigger than 51. It's just an absolutely crazy thing, but they can do that, okay? Yeah? No, so this map, exi this map exists. This is the tangent bundle, right? So you imagine, this is, you, M is embedded in Euclidean space. Right, you, you, you stick M in Euclidean space. 
Okay, so by the way, that's already an act of violence, okay, which, uh, right, because, you know, M started off being this nice intrinsic thing, okay, you're going to introduce some distortion when you stick it in Euclidean space, and that distortion is partially responsible for the Lipschitz constant in the Tom map, okay, okay, but not fully, but partially, okay. So one, the evil of algebraicization. And it's, okay. In Chicago, they say there's no free lunch. Okay, that's sort of the principle of the university that I'm at. Uh, although they definitely try to fake you out sometimes, like, oh, have lunch with the dean. Anyway. <laughs> But anyway, so now let me talk about the evil of algebraicization, just to show you what goes wrong. And what I think the biggest philosophical thing that goes wrong, and there are, there are a number of things that do, is that you'll typically make a group out of equivalence classes of things. And then you'll use in a proof, and then you'll say A equals B, and of course B equals C, and therefore A equals C, and you might do this an unbounded number of times in the course, in the course of a proof, and that's a complete disaster because you're not paying royalties every time you use that equal sign because they're not really the same. Okay? So let me just give, you know, just give you an example to just see how you can't turn one of these proofs into anything that you'd be interested in. Okay? And also, I'm not going to prove anything hard, so I should prove something easy. Okay? So here's a theorem. If G is a finite group, then the set of genuses, I know I should say genera, but of surfaces, sigma sub g, on which g acts preserving orientation, is equal to a set of the form G congruent to one mod N sub G with finitely many exceptions. Okay, so, you know, if you, you know, so a, a torus, Right? That has, of course, you know, ZM cross ZN as symmetry. It also has a clever Z3 that you might think of, right? It has a few exotic symmetries, but that's basically it. They're all pretty, it's all pretty abelian, or very close to abelian. You know, A5 doesn't act on the, on the torus. You know, as genus 2, you get different groups that act, okay? But for every finite group, there's some number N sub G that tells you the story, with finitely many exceptions. Okay, um, and it turns out that if G is cyclic, that number N sub G is one, so then your condition is that you have to be congruent to one mod one. So in fact, you know, for, all, you know, for every cyclic group, all sufficiently large genera have a cyclic symmetry. Okay, but for a group like Z5 cross Z5, then N sub G turns out to be five, so then you have to be congruent to one mod five. Okay, Effective, right? That went without saying until you said it, and now it's now it's now it's common knowledge in the sense that Maurice talked about. <laughs> okay, okay. So let me prove this. Okay, and you'll see how evil algebraic topology. I mean, how absolutely incredible algebraic topology is, because you'll see that the proof doesn't tell us what n sub g is nor does it tell us how many exceptions, and it gives us no way to actually answer the questions that we might be interested in, okay? And I think that this is sort of typical um, uh, of, the, of, of what algebraic topology do, does. I mean, you, in the end, you're going, it feels like one's approaching an oracle, right? They give you information, you can rely on it if you understand it, and 
you know, but you might not really discover the answers to your questions, especially, for example, if Gromov were right, that things would be two to the two to the two. I mean, if Gromov's theorem were close to the truth, okay? And there are other theorems where the situation is even worse than, than Gromov's bound. Um, but I don't want to talk about those now. So here's a proof. If G arises, so does G plus the order of the group, right? So here's a, this is a surface of genus G. I just follow an orbit around, and I just add in a handle, right? I mean, just follow this point. I just add a handle. I've added G. Ah, so I might as well now reduce to the Z modulo the order of G. See, I've introduced an algebraic structure. I've identified two genera if they differ by this, and I've said I now have a problem in studying this object. Okay, right? Algebraic action number one. Maneuver number one. Okay, then the next thing is that if G arises and G prime arises, then I could do the same thing following around orbits on each of these. And then you see you get G plus G prime minus one. Ah, so the genera minus one form a subgroup. Subgroups of the cyclic group, thanks to classification, are cyclic. That produces for me the number n sub g. So what does this proof tell me? That there is an n sub g, it divides the order of g, and it tells me nothing else. Okay? I could begin looking for it, I could begin examining each of these mapping class groups, finding all their subgroups, but I'll never learn, you know, so after a while I will discover the truth, I'll discover what that n sub g is, but I'll never be sure that maybe there's something in between the guy I discovered and the order of the group, and that I just haven't figured out Right? I don't know how, with, how far in genus to go before the thing begins existing. I really know nothing about the problem, except that you know, some formal thing about the solution to the problem. Right? It, it, it's very, very you know, hard to falsify this kind of result, right? so it's not science. So anyway, so that's an example of the evil of algebraicization, and this is what occurs throughout topology. Okay, you introduce equivalence relations, things magically become groups when you're lucky, Okay? Then you study them, and you study them by whatever tools you, you can. Okay? Um, okay. So, so let me talk a little bit about maps from X to Y that are ellipses. Okay, right, so this is, this is some space. So firstly, how big is it? Okay, and like in a prison movie, who's asking? Okay, so let's, let's, let's first figure out what scale we mean. Okay, so, so let's say this is Y, right? So there, it has some kind of convexity radius of epsilon, such so that if I have two functions that are within epsilon of each other, then two points with an epsilon of each other, there's a unique geodesic that connects it, or some alternative to this, okay? I mean, if you're not a manifold. So suppose you have this structure, then you might as well cover, let me just call this thing ML, ML by epsilon balls, okay? Because those things are essentially convex. You have to be a little bit careful when you do this because the Lipschitz constant might multiply by a little amount when you, when you do such, you know, as I move F to G in this way, you know, I mean, you know, think about what happens in Euclidean space. The Lipschitz constant doesn't go up when you form the chord, but then you push it out a little bit. Okay, so, you know, that's not so bad, but remember, we're going to be persistent anyway. So, you know, so that doesn't really bother me. So the first question, that you might ask about this is how many balls does it take, right? That's the first measurement. And by the way, this is, you know, in terms of problem number one, this seems very natural. I take a point. In this small region, you might go ahead and use vector fields for parameterizing the other functions. So there is some linear structure in this neighborhood of a given function. So that doesn't feel so bad. And what you're interested in are the nonlinear aspects. Right, so sort of how many linear charts does it take? So the answer is x is x of l to the dimension of x. Okay, which exponential it is depends on the geometry of y. I don't want to worry about that right now, but and I leave this as an exercise 
Okay? There's one case that, that I believe that most people here know is the case when x is a circle. Okay? This is the loop space of y. Okay? And you might know that, you know that people will talk about the growth of a discrete group and it'll usually be exponential. Sometimes it'll be polynomial and then you have a the theorem of Gromov. Right? But the usual situation is exponential and that's because two functions that are close enough, we saw you could homotop. So now the question is, how many balls does it take to cover the function space? Right, the space of maps from the circle into your target. And that is exponential in the Lipschitz constant. The Lipschitz constant is just the length of the curve, or the length of the word in the fundamental group. OK? I mean, so those all, things all become the same. OK? Now, OK? So that's, you know, so, so that's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of kind of bad news, but, um, but it, it might suggest the following. So let's, let me make a conjecture, that, which is this, that if f and g map x to y are L Lipschitz and homotopic, then they are, let me, can I call this a false conjecture? Yeah, let me, let me say that just so that if I don't finish the talk, you know, I don't lay a minefield, you know, uh, then they are C sub Y of L Lipschitz homotopic. Well, let me, just, let me say C sub, homotopic through C sub L, C sub Y times L Lipschitz maps. Okay. okay, that would be one kind of conjecture I could make. Suppose that you believe a conjecture like this, okay? If you believe this, haha, -ha, it's hard to believe a conjecture labeled false, but, but, but if you believe this, then, well, then you're in pretty good shape because then the homotopy from x cross well, let me say zero x of L to the dimension of x to y will be CL Lipschitz. Okay, so let's think about this. I'm going to be trying to build a homotopy. Okay, so I make a graph, right? I'm going to be covering this function space with a bunch of functions. So, okay, I do that, and they're pretty dense. They're epsilon dense. And now I ask, and, I, and this was the, and I'm asking, I want to find an efficient homotopy. I don't want the ones the algebraic topologists say exist. They don't even give it to me, okay? I'm not trying to improve something they gave me, okay? Man, the oracle didn't even give me one, right? It just tells me one exists. So that means I'm in a component, which means that the length is at most the size of the component. Okay, so I'll get something of about this size. Okay, so that's better than nothing. It's better than a tower of exponentials. I mean, it's exponential in a polynomial. Okay, so if I had a theorem like this, that would be really cool. Okay, and then hopefully I could use it. Okay, so. Okay, so now let me. throw some cold water on this. Okay, so one, why it's false. Two, sometimes okay. And three, even better. Okay. Okay, so let me, let me start off firstly, why is this false? Okay, and now we already know from the special case of x equals a circle. Okay? You know that any finitely presented group is the fundamental group of some space. And you know there are some groups that have an unsolvable word problem. Which means that if I write a word, I can't tell whether that word is trivial or not. And even the algebraic topologists can't tell me, right? Because what they told me was just a presentation. They didn't you know, tell me anything more than that, right? 
that, you know, that's sort of a bad oracle day, okay? Right, I need an oracle for the oracle, okay? Right, so what happens? I would take a word, so I know how to write down a curve that represents that. I know what the length is going to be. It's going to be some multiple of the length of the word, okay? Now, if I knew that I didn't have to go, you know, more than a constant times the length, then I'd write down an algorithm. I'd begin pushing the curve around, you know, in this simplicial complex and see if I could shrink it down or not. If I can, then I say, no, it's trivial. And if I can't, then since the theorem was true, the conjecture was true, then I would be having an algorithm. Okay? So, in fact, you can turn this around. You could show that there's a thing called the Dane function of a group, uh, which measures how hard it is to trivialize trivial words. Okay? And you can see that if the Dane function is super exponential, Okay, where the exponential comes out of these considerations, if it's actually super exponential, then say there are always going to be null homotopic geodesics and things like that, which just can't get shrunk. Okay, so there's actually a beautiful tight uh, combination. So why is it false? Pi one kills you. Okay, that when you have significant fundamental group around, that can cause problems. Right, and, and now, you might imagine that if pi 1 is bad, pi 2 will be worse, um, but that is not the case. So, let me, so here is a theorem uh, which is due to Steve Ferry and me, and it actually appeared in PNAS, okay? And it goes like this. It says, okay, the following are equivalent. for a finite complex Y. The first one is that F and G from X to Y, L Lipschitz and homotopic are C of the dimension of X. I guess I could put in a Y here times L homotopic, okay? So, by the way, so what this means is that there's a map from X cross zero, one to Y, okay? Such that I have F at the beginning and Y and that this is, and that this is Lipschitz. Better than what was predicted by this kind of statement, right? That Persistence homotopy would still then lead me to worry about, oh, you know, what is the size of this space? So this statement includes the fact that map xy l has sort of bounded diameter, right? Because you get to keep this thing here having zero one. Okay? This can't be algebraic topology, right? I mean, you know, you're getting this thing, when you concatenate two things of length L, you usually get something of length 2L. This says that you're not, despite all the concatenation, despite this, the size of this. So these spaces are really, really beautiful. They have huge numbers of vertices. Each vertex is typically connected to huge numbers of others. And they have, well, in this, it turns out that they have bounded diameter. In the, well, in case one, and then case two is that it never happens. One is equivalent to two. And the second condition is that all the pi star of y are all finite. Okay, that you could check, by the way. That means that pi one of y is finite. And the homology of the universal cover, you know, with say rational coefficients are all zero. Okay, so this is something that, you know, you could tell by looking at a space, whether it has this property. And so now a wonderful thing is that the space Y that occurs in Rene Tom's unoriented theorem has this property because two times any cobordism class vanishes, right? So therefore everything, it has to be a finite group. Okay, so the theorem applies, so you get this. So there is some automatic promotion in the unoriented case that comes, out, that comes out of the theorem. But the theorem really has two parts I want to emphasize. One is that a persistence homotopy group vanishes, 
And that feels like something that we're giving back to the algebraic topologists. You know, they should be, you know, they should be computing now persistent homology of function spaces. Okay? And then the other part is that something has finite diameter. Okay? Anyway, the theorem is that these two things are equivalent. Okay? Now, the bad news is that we wanted to, to consider oriented bordism, for example, or we care about other spaces. And we don't know what the answer is in general. And there's a serious obstruction here, because this is an if and only if statement. Right? You know, given, that our, you know, given that we're having these kind of goals, uh, there's some real profound obstruction that comes up in general. So let me just say an interpretation of this theorem. Unfortunately, I don't know that the interpretation is correct. Okay? The interpretation says that, okay, so in real life, we don't need to do it for all x's uniformly, the constant just depending on the dimension. I don't mind if the constant depends on the geometry of x. And that turns out to be the case. When, you have some, when your space y has some infinite homotopy group, you know, even when there is such a thing, there will be a constant that depends on the geometry of, of the geometry of x. It's not just its dimension that enters. Okay? So that's what happens. And what I'd like to say is that this says that if y has the rational homotopy type of a point, right, that's homotopy groups are finite rational homotopy type of a point. Those sound like they should be the same thing. Okay? Well, for a point, the theorem is obvious. If I have a map to a point, two homotopic maps to a point, yeah, I see how to build a homotopy, fine. And then for anything homotopy equivalent to a point, it's also obvious, although maybe a little bit harder. Not much, okay? But now, but the fact that it's rational homotopy invariant is unobvious. And one would like to say that all of these questions boil down to rational homotopy theory. We do not know that. Um, I have about four minutes left. So let me just tell you what I know about this question of Gromov. And I... Um, won't have time to explain much else. So anyway, so here is a theorem that is joint work of Greg Chambers, uh, Dominic Dotterer, uh, Fedya Manin, and myself. And it says this, it says that in each dimension, um, there exists a polynomial depending on the dimension, such that the volume of W is at most P sub D of the volume of M. So instead of it being a tower of exponentials, it turns out that there is a polynomial. So that's the good news. Okay. Uh, the bad news is that for us, the degree of the polynomial is exponential, um, and the coefficients are ineffective. Okay, so um, in terms of what my goal was, which was trying to understand 20th century topology and, you know, the way things worked, I feel like we've pushed a little bit further, but we really see how little we understand, right, when that's the best kind of bound you can get. I mean, I have no clue, really, how hard it is to find co-boundaries for manifolds that bound. I mean, you know, just sort of things that were understood in the 1950s, you know, we still don't understand. The key point is that it turns out that Y's that are rationally products of spheres can also be analyzed. Okay? And it's already a new, a new feature arises. When it's odd dimensional spheres that occur, then the diameter of these function spaces grows linearly with the Lipschitz constant. When, it, when we have an even dimensional sphere, it looks like it grows like L squared. So all of a sudden there's new geometric aspects of homotopy theory that also are entering through these kind of uh, discoveries. Uh, I think that I will just leave all of this mysterious to you um, because I can't do any better than that in one minute. So I'll stop here. Yes. Great question. Okay. So let me complain about the algebraic topologists again. Okay. 
What the hell? Okay, so, okay, so for example, everything that I said here, I could have studied PL manifolds instead of smooth manifolds. Okay, and there are people, there's this big fat book, it's not so fat, it's 300 pages or around, of Madsen and Milgram that's called The Classifying Spaces of Surgery and blah, blah, blah. And in there, it gives you an, the algorithm for computing when a PL manifold is null cobordant. And it turns out that there are three torsion and five torsion. There's torsion for every prime. It's really incredibly messy, but it is, in some sense, algorithmic. But now you could ask a Gromov type question. If something has n simplices, how many simplices must a co-boundary have? And the problem is, none of this, and, the, and for example, the unoriented case should work exactly the same way, right? Two times anything bounds, after all, m union m bounds m cross i, has finite homotopy groups. Right, so why don't you just apply the theorem? Well, the answer is, Rene Tom did explicit work. He had the universal bundle over the Grassmannian, that's a compact homogeneous space. You take the one-point compactification, you get a nice finite polyhedron that you could apply all of this stuff to. What happens for MFPL? Okay, that's what they call it. That's the analog of that thing. Well, that's a space that exists thanks to the Brown representation theorem. Not that there's a green representation and a yellow one. Ed Brown proved this representation theorem that all sorts of things are, are there's some space that determines it, okay? And that space is homotopy equivalent to a, you know, in, for each dimension, there's a finite complex that, that maps to it. That's an isomorphism and homotopy through that dimension, but it isn't, isn't itself a natural finite complex. So it's not clear that any of these methods have any bearing on that. You know, so there's another thing, right, that I didn't even begin complaining about because these problems were so concrete, you know, that you knew what you were talking about. There, they talk about maps into spaces where those spaces only exist thanks to general categorical aspects of the category of spaces. I mean, it's just freaky stuff. And then you want to go ahead and put a metric on that and talk about Lipschitz. I mean, if you go ahead and do it just by hand, you probably have done something meaningless. Okay, so the answer is, so for PL, I know what the theorem is. I have no idea how to prove it. That's, the that's one of the next conceptual steps in my project of understanding the 20th century, right? In places where you're being completely existential, right? So that probably doesn't have applications to parallel processing or anything like that, right? Because their, their output spaces were really concrete. If you're doing machine learning of some sort, you have a concrete space. But if you're a, top a geometric topologist, you're not that lucky. You just get a space that was given to you by the algebraic topologists that then they analyze for you and you understood nothing from the whole process. Yeah, so I know the PL result. I mean, I'm willing to make that as a conjecture, namely that it's exactly the same as the smooth, but I currently do not know how to prove it. I mean, I don't also know whether there's a solution that's just magic that fits on the back of an envelope or whether this is going to be something that takes another 10, 15 years to sort through. I mean, it's a new kind of question as far as I can tell.